Welcome to my Max32 programming tutorial. This video will teach you how to get up and running with the Digilent Chipkit Max32, including some of the base concepts required to understand what's going on under the hood. The Max32 is a microcontroller development board. As you can see in the graphic, there is a large surface mount component with a hundred tiny leads coming off of it. This is Microchip's PIC32MX795F512L, one of their premier 32-bit MCUs. Digilent developed this board specifically for that chip, and we have decided to use it to control the pod thanks to its many features. The 10,000-foot view of our task is to make sure the pod's electrical system works as designed. This includes actuating brakes, controlling motor speeds, obtaining and wirelessly transmitting data for many sensors, and a few other very important behaviors. A microprocessor is a great tool to accomplish this because it has individual hardware modules dedicated to many of these specific functions. We can pulse with modulate signals at desired frequencies and duty cycles, capture input on specific pins which we may use to compute the frequency of a signal or trigger an event. We can estimate the voltage of a signal using the chip's analog to digital converter. We can have our code interrupted in order to execute more pressing tasks based on both software and external hardware events. We can have registers incremented at specific frequencies completely independent of code execution for timing. And most generally, we can turn pins on and off, including some LEDs on the board itself, which is great for debugging. Here are just six of the ways our microcontroller can share information over physical wires. CAN, I2C, and Serial, or UART, we will use heavily. We may not implement USB and Ethernet, though the chip contains hardware modules for both. It will take time to become familiar with the methodology behind each protocol, but it is essential that we know what our signals look like down to the bit in some cases. In order to take control of this microcontroller, we need to give it the instructions to execute, but as you'll find out, we won't be writing instructions manually though it may feel like it at times. The board is designed to have this done using an external programmer, the Picket 3 in our case. The chip is designed to be programmed via the in-circuit serial programming interface, and as you can see from the images in the upper right, this is how the Picket 3 is designed to work as well. If you have any familiarity with Arduino, you'll notice that on the box for the Max32 the phrase for the Arduino community appears. This is because the device comes pre-programmed with a serial bootloader, and Digilent provides MPIDE, an Arduino IDE clone ported to their MCU. If we were to leverage that instead, the device could program itself by parsing incoming serial data. This would take place over USB, and above the blue square where we see the ICSP header on the Max32, there is a female USB B mini jack where an FTDI chip is to its right. The FTDI IC exists to convert USB protocol to standard UART. This is exactly how Arduinos are programmed, only instead of an FTDI chip, they opted to go with another Atmel MCU. The reason we will not use MPIDE is that the implementation details of all of the peripheral functionality will be fully customized to our needs. MPIDE and Arduino IDE simply are not meant for production applications. They are extremely useful teaching tools for helping students and hobbyists understand to a greater level of abstraction what programming hardware is like. We will be using MPLAB X IDE, an amazing tool developed and maintained by Microchip. This is an embedded C environment. We won't be looking at the instruction set or having to write any assembly as I mentioned before. C is a compiled language and Microchip also provides XC32, their 32-bit MCU compiler. Without this, this would not be possible. Hopefully things are making a bit of sense and you're ready to ask how to start writing the code. The first concept to understand is that the chip needs to have some of its hardware configured. This includes choosing between an internal or external clock source, which multipliers and dividers to apply to that source, and things like code protect bits and read write bits. These configurations are known as fuses. They are bytes of memory that get set when writing to the device's program memory and persist after the device is powered off. You can see an example of settings we use on this slide. It's much more important to know what each setting bit does than the entire circuitry behind its implementation, such as in the block diagram. A few read-throughs of the datasheet will be necessary, which we'll get to. For now, let's say our goal is to interact with the Max32 by typing commands to it and having them sent over USB. 
As programmers, we use console output for debugging and for most proof of concept applets, such as the ones created as an undergraduate CS student. In that case, console output is modestly the end goal. With hardware, we are extremely limited in terms of ways to verify things are happening correctly. We could blink onboard LED 1 if A happens and onboard LED 2 if B happens, but what about complex operations? What about operations happening faster than we could perceive visually? Having the ability to communicate to our device from our computer in a terminal would be a significant triumph. First we need to ask, is this even possible? We know an FTDI chip is present on the board that converts USB serial to UART, which actually stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Serial describes anything that happens one bit at a time, and it's not the name of any specific protocol. When you connect to the board with your computer using the USB cable, it will get recognized as a serial device and attached to a serial port as can be seen on the slide. A long time ago, PCs used to have serial connectivity built into the motherboard, but we don't use this protocol very often anymore, so this has been phased out. We know a physical interface is present, but how can we access this in software? On our PC, we need a serial monitor program that has access to these serial ports. There are many third-party pieces of software that provide this function, including PuTTY, which is often used for secure shell connections, but I'll be using YAT, which is short for yet another terminal in this example. The next video would be a tutorial on getting set up with our development environment, so don't worry about it too much for now. Now we need to make sure we understand what UART is. Physically, it's two wires, TX and RX. Notice that TX of one device goes into the RX of the other. Think of this as a divided highway. There's no opportunity for what is referred to in other protocols as a bus collision, where two devices attempt to take control over or influence the voltage of the same physical wire. If we had to design a system to send information over two wires, how would we do it? Maybe we'd need a range of voltage levels to signify different values. This isn't the case, but it certainly is possible, and if you have some time, do some research on analog computers. This protocol uses only high and low. High, any voltage between 3 and 25 volts signifies a zero, and low, any voltage between negative 3 and negative 25 volts signifies a 1. We notice that this is far outside of the range of our analog and digital pins that can only tolerate 0 to 3.3 volts. The reason we see a higher voltage here is so that we can use longer wires and not have to worry about losing data due to voltage drops. Now, we know how to send a 1 and a 0, or rather we at least know how it happens. How do we know how to accept this information? If you have taken ECE203, you are familiar with the idea of aliasing, but for those who haven't, consider this example. One device checks the voltage of the RX bus 10,000 times per second, but the device sending the information from its TX port is altering that same voltage 115,000 times per second. We certainly have a problem. This brings us to the second important convention of this serial protocol, an agreed upon rate for sending and receiving information which is known as the baud rate. For the skeptics wondering about differences in phases that may occur from powering the device on at different times or simply turning the hardware module on at different times, this is solved by the use of a start bit when the data line is pulled high by the TX device for the first time or following a stop bit the RX receiving ends clock cycle begins. Okay. We now need to know how to get serial started on our device and set the baud rate. Now it's time to look at the datasheet. It's important to make a habit of referencing documentation and datasheets for any hardware or software libraries you work with. You will save yourself a lot of time and frustration this way. The UART baud rate generator equation comes from the datasheet for this particular family of microchips MCUs. I'll provide a link to it in the description. Here we see two equations, one for baud rate and one for UXBRG. The X in UXBRG is there because there are multiple UART hardware modules, each given an integer ID like 1 through 4. The BRG signifies that there is a memory location we need to set to a certain value to achieve the desired baud rate. Looking at the UART mode register, we don't see the BRG anywhere. 
But if we read 21.3 more closely, we read the phrase, the UART module has a dedicated 16-bit baud rate generator. We can infer from that that it must be a separate register. The last thing worth mentioning is that every bit in UX mode is a setting, though notice that not all 32 bits are necessary. Each bit will have a default, and we'll need to look at the datasheet to decide which bits to set and which bits not to set. Sometimes we may not even understand the wording or know what significance a certain feature has. In these cases, it's important to address ambiguities during debugging. Instead of looking at all these settings now, let's do it in, on the fly as we program. Check out the next video and see how to get set up with MPLAB and YAT.